Welcome to Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions, the place to learn how to fund, scale, exit, and massively profit as an angel investor or entrepreneur. Brought to you by the Angel Investors Network. And now, here's your host, Jeff Barnes. Hey there, this is Jeff Barnes with Angel Investors Network and the Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions podcast. And I want to invite you into an incredible episode today where we spoke with a gentleman by the name of Justin Donald, who has some incredible insights into how to go about investing. And not just from the standpoint of investing for the long term and for the growth and appreciation, but rather lifestyle investing. Investing in ways that enhance your lifestyle, enhance the day to day. In fact, using the strategies that he talks about in today's podcast, he mentioned how one investment was able to free his wife up from having to work. So one investment replaced her annual salary, allowing her to focus more on living the life that she wanted. Justin's come up with the 10 commandments of lifestyle investing that we're going to be talking about towards the end. And I think these are incredible commandments that everybody needs to listen to. So make sure you stay tuned all the way through and and finish the end. And we're definitely going to go into one of my favorite topics, which is Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant and how you can take advantage of this idea of lifestyle investing to create the life that you want and allow money to do the hard work for you. Enjoy. Hello and welcome everyone. This is Jeff Barnes, Angel Investors Network, and this is the Angels Exits and Acquisitions Podcast. I am here today with my co-host, Erock. Erock, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, my friend. Good to be here. Wonderful. Glad to hear that. And we have a, a special guest here today who has done a lot of really cool things. And I think some stuff that people are going to be very interested in learning a lot about because Entrepreneur Magazine calls this gentleman the Warren Buffett of lifestyle investing. He's a master of low risk cash flow investing, specializing in simplifying complex financial strategies. Already like it. Structuring deals even better and disciplined investment systems that consistently produce profitable results. Also very important. His ethos is create wealth without creating a job. In the span of 21 months and before he turned 40 years old, Justin Donald's investments drove enough passive income for both he and his wife, Jennifer, to leave their jobs, which I know a lot of people are going to love to learn more about. Following his simple investment values and 10 commandments of lifestyle investing, Justin negotiated deals with over 50 companies, multiplied his net worth to over eight figures, and maintained a family-centric lifestyle in less than two years. And just two years later, he doubled his net worth again. Justin's a member of Tiger 21 and a board member of Front Row Foundation International. He and Jennifer contribute to various causes privately and through their church, from fighting cancer to building clean water wells in third world countries. Additionally, they sponsor multiple children through Compassion International. The Donalds are based in Austin, Texas, and love adventure-based international travel with their beloved daughter. Justin, welcome to the podcast. So glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So. I'm really excited about a lot of things you said in there, but the one thing that I'm really excited about is understanding lifestyle investing and how that sets you up for success before you even turn 40 years old. Yeah, well, I guess really I had this idea of uh, not being a slave to the money that I make or being a slave to, you know, a a job, not having these golden handcuffs where, you, you know, income's good, but Uh, you get so accustomed to that lifestyle, it makes it hard to leave. You become dependent on that income. And I just got sick of trading time for money. And I really wanted to get to a place where my time was independent of any money. And I I just, you know, had been reading a lot and uh, researching things and meeting people. and, And I just felt like I had this clear understanding that I could really make the pivot from uh, time equaling income to assets equaling income. And it, it was such a game changer for, for my family and for myself. I love that. I love that. So one of the first books that I ever read that got me into this mindset of separating myself of time for money was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And then of course, like every good entrepreneur and then investor, you follow the train, right? You follow the chain of all the different books they've read and whatnot. And I remember reading that book when I was hung over 21 years old it, and I uh, decided to buy my first property and then became a financial advisor and learned this whole thing about the world about finance and money. And I had that same type of epiphany, right? I cannot just be a slave to a job. At the time, I was in the Navy, so I was technically enslaved in something. Um, but that was a big black tube underwater thousands of miles away. So we won't go too deep into that one. But 
I want to know what was your background? Like, why did you, what, what brought you to that point where you had that shift? Cause most people never even have that epiphany. They just think they have to do it that way. That's the way they were raised. That's the way their parents brought them up, the way school brought them up. So what was your journey that led you up to that point? Yeah, great question. Uh, so really, you know, my parents just worked normal jobs, uh, you know, nothing special. And so uh, out of college, well, actually, while I was in college, I started working with Cutco and I uh, was selling their product uh, on an in-home appointment basis. And that, that's really how I paid for my college. And I noticed this thing called commissions, you know, work really hard and you're rewarded beyond just, uh, you know, j- just a flat rate. And so I really like that. I did really well. And, and I progressed in management with that company. And and there are so many entrepreneurial lessons that I learned in opening an office for them and uh, kind of moving up the ranks in in the Cutco organization. But I really just got to a point where I was working a lot of hours and I knew that that's just not what I wanted it to look like in the future. I had done a good job of building some systems and scaling some things, but to a certain degree, busy season's always busy season. And, and there's only so much you can do to, uh, you know, kind of create a healthy or keep a healthy organization going or growing uh, when someone really needs to be putting the pedal to the gas. And so I just realized that though that's nice and though I love just the idea of having my own business and, and I've since started several other businesses, I just need to do it in a way that I truly can scale, that it's not just me and it's something that can scale beyond me. Uh, and so that's really where the investing got going. And you, you mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I mean, that was probably my first big uh, aha type of book where I'm like, yeah, I should probably buy some assets. Um, and And that led me to his second book, which is Cashflow Quadrant, which is probably the most impactful book that I ever read. And it just left me, it, it basically gave me this idea or this blueprint that, um, you, you know, from being an employee, I could move to, you know, a, a, an independent contractor or self-employed. And then from there, I could move into a business owner. And then from there, I could move into an investor. And then here are all the tax benefits and all, all the, you know, I mean, not just tax benefits, like the wealth of every type of benefit for being on the side of business owner and investor. And so in my mind at an early age, at a very, you know, young and pivotal age, my early 20s, I mean, this is, I read this book uh, right out of college. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And I also had a really big realization because I thought that I was running my own business. So when I read this, I'm like, yeah, I'm a business owner. But really, the more you look at it, you know, a business owner, someone that can remove themselves, that, they're, that the business can function for a year or longer without them and not just function, like grow, do really well, at least remain, you know, consistent and the same, but ideally grow. If it's going to dip without the, the owner in charge, you're probably self-employed, not a business owner. And that was just a big wake up call to me that for so long, I was thinking that I had my own business and I, I had portions of it that were my own business. I had aspects of it that were, were my own business, but really I was a slave to my business, that I was the person that made it tick, that the conversations that I had, if I, if I stopped having those with people or if I stopped kind of um, you know pressing certain levers then business was going to shrink, right? And so that was a big wake-up call that I'm okay doing this for a period of time to learn how to do it, to build my skill set, to teach other people, to trial and error some different uh, strategies. But I know I don't want to do that long-term. I just I don't want to be in that long-term because that's not scalable. So love, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, you know, what do you talk about the cash flow quadrants? And so my question to you is, is like, obviously you could talk about that in theory, right? And it's one thing to say, hey, I want to go through this kind of process, but you've actually gone through the process. And so maybe you can share with our audience a little bit about how you were in the role of Cutco, which that was my first ever, if you want to call it business back when I was a teenager back in the day. Um, So kudos to Cutco. But how did you go through the process of being at Cutco? And then is that where you like created the capital in which you started to go into the investing realm? Because some people are like, 
of course I want to become an investor, but how do I generate the capital to start doing that? Yeah, that's exactly right, Eric. Uh, and really, it, it was just great to have an opportunity to make good income for the work that I was doing. So I'm forever grateful for that experience and for not just what I was able to earn monetarily, but what I was able to learn uh, experientially. But yeah, I, I was very aggressive in saving. Um, I, I live very much beneath my means. I, I put a lot of money away and, and I worked hard with that company. I, I really put in the time. I put in very crazy hours, especially in my young years as I was building things out. Uh, and, and I really excelled there. And so as the income, as my income increased, my lifestyle did not. And I just kept socking away cash, waiting, because I didn't know I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what the the magic bullet was. Like, what do I invest in? How do I make this transition? How do I make this leap? This is scary. The only thing I know is running an office, you know, for, for Cutco. And, and so it was just kind of, you know, taking one step at a time, learning what other people do, having lunches with people that are in the space that I want to get into or are, are successful in their own right. And, and they're doing it differently than me. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of just like being, uh, so first of all, I'm a sponge, but I'm a huge fan of mirroring other people's success. I, if someone, you know, success leaves clues. So I, I am going to be the greatest detective and the, I may not be the most innovative person, but I am a really good copycat. And if someone tells me that they have had success with something and they have a program, well, if, I just copy it. I know I can get the same results. And then with time, I know that I can get better and I know I can probably innovate. I don't have to innovate right away. Uh, and, and, you know, for me, I, I once I kind of uh, get my feet under me for something new, then I, I can start seeing the areas of opportunity and I can make some little tweaks. And, and that's benefited me tremendously. I love that. I love that. So I love your, your, Bringing up cash flow quadrant, that's a lot of what we do at Angel Network is we try to explain to people that you're never going to be rich just being an employee. You've got to eventually get over to that investor side and you know, just the, the right side of the quadrant, the business owner and the investor. And you can be both at the same time, which is awesome. That's what most people who end up being incredibly successful are is they own businesses, but they also invest in other businesses. And most of the time as an owner, they are an investor in their own business. And the, the question I want to ask to you is, what was that first major leap? Like you said, what the first aha was, but what was the first big thing where you said, listen, you know, going off of what Iraq was saying, you know, you, you can listen to the theory and you can copy people. And you can say, okay, I'm going to copy this person. I know what this works, but what was that first really big, scary leap that you took to go, okay, now I'm going to try and jump onto that right side of the quadrant. You know, I could answer this in, in two different ways, Jeff. It, it's interesting because part of me felt like the way to do it was to own my own home first, and then I could rent it out. And in hindsight, I probably, you know, wouldn't do that. I would do it differently. I actually feel like I'd rather have income producing assets prior to something that is going to be on the liability side, you know, where I'm going to owe money. Um, but that's how I started. And I started just renting out my room to friends. I had, you know, I bought a two bedroom condo in Chicago. And uh, that seemed to be really great, except that I bought it in 2005. Um, and so it ended up not really being great. Uh, I held on to it for a while. I ended up moving for a bigger opportunity and moved to St. Louis. And uh, I ended up renting it out running it to two different people and then eventually one different person. And it was just kind of like problem after problem. Uh, I don't have to get into all the details, but it ended up not being a good investment. I ended up being upside down when I went to sell it. And um, there was all kind of, of uh, I had the penthouse unit, the top unit, and there was just a, a long story short, a hole, a leak in the roof that wasn't covered by my insurance, wasn't covered by the HOA. So I had all kinds of damage and I was like, all right, I'm done with this. So I actually thought that I was going to get ahead by getting my own place and running it out, but that wasn't the correct answer for me. And by the way, that could work for someone else with some of the new models that exist today that could work, uh, especially if you're in a hot market. But I realized that that wasn't the path. The path is I need more cash flow. Um, when, I, when I invest, first of all, I want it to support my lifestyle. I want it to help get me closer to the life that I want to live. 
meaning that it respects my time. And then secondly, I want to get some sort of cash flow out of it. I want to be able to use money on a regular basis from that investment, whether it be on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, but something like that where I'm getting regular distributions. Um, and uh, so really from there, I started talking to friends that own a bunch of single family homes. And, and I talked to a bunch of people that own apartment complexes. I thought I was going to get into the apartment complex game. I had looked at some three flats and some four flats in Chicago. And that made a lot of sense to me. And then I had a friend that went to a mobile home park boot camp and came back and he was doing really well. He had uh, a bunch of single family homes. I think he brought me somewhere between seven and 10. And he's like, I'm selling all these. I'm going into mobile home parks. And I thought he was crazy. I was like, that sounds like the worst idea ever. But the more he talked about it and the more I thought about the way that the cash flow worked, the more it really did make sense. You know, you're, you're making an investment into an asset and that asset has multiple units. So if someone doesn't pay, it's not like 100% rent wasn't paid. It's like 1% or 5% wasn't paid. And I started to really like that model. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch him and I'm going to see how he does. And if he does well... I may copy him. And if he doesn't, then I'm not going to do it. The genesis so, of the uh, copycat. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm such a copycat. And, uh, and he did really well. And, uh, and so he was raising money and he's like, yeah, I could pay you, you know, a great return, 10% on your money, guaranteed. And I'm like, 10%? How are you able to pay me 10%? You know, that, that's more than I'm going to make in the stock market, you know, after taxes and everything. And uh, plus, we don't ever know if there's going to be a downturn or what's going on right now, right? So, you know, maybe that time frame, it looks like it's, it could be even way less, you know, but um, I, I lent him money. And I remember just how easy it was. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this guy is making a return that's large enough to pay me a 10% return, but I know he's making money on this. And then the more I learn about it, I realized he doesn't buy any deals that are less than a 20% cash on cash return. So I'm like, holy cow, this guy's making 10% and I'm making 10%. And I said, why don't I just do that? And I remember, I actually had a conversation with him. I'm like, why should I give you my money or invest my money in you and your companies when I can do it myself? And thank goodness he was a good friend. He goes, I don't know. <laughs> why, why aren't you doing it yourself? I've been trying to tell you, you should. I love, that. That's, I love it. <laughs> so I decided to go to a boot camp because I didn't know anything about it. And I just, I wanted to learn how to do it. So I went to uh, Frank and Dave's boot camp, Frank Rolfe and Dave Reynolds, and learned everything there is to know about mobile home parks. And uh, I mean, this is like, you know, over a decade ago. And since then, we've purchased many mobile home parks. So we hold, you know, around 500 units. We've bought and sold them. Um, so we've, we've made some pretty good money on flips, but it's just been a great cash flowing asset. And that really is what got me to the point that I recognized the income or the cash flow was strong enough that I could replace my current income at that time if I accumulated enough. And so with the first purchase of my first park, I was able to replace the income of my wife. So my wife was a teacher. She was earning about $36,000 a year. She taught high school um, at a, a school in St. Louis and uh, she taught uh, business classes. It's, Missouri is a, one of the few states where uh, business is a requirement in high school. And so uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool uh, class and she did personal finance and business and a bunch of different stuff. But she was making $36,000 a year. Plus she was uh, coaching uh, on uh, sports afterwards to make some extra cash. And I, and I knew like, if I can just find something that can cash flow that $36,000 a year, I mean, it's, it's not necessary. I mean, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's really not a lot of money. You know, if you, if you take 36 and you divide it by 12, you're talking about $3,000 a month. So how do I find something that produces that? And so I did and uh, we bought it and she immediately was able to, you know, retire or, or stop teaching, which is super cool. And we shortly after that had our, our daughter. I love it. Like that, that's awesome. But I, I've got to hit on one really important thing that you didn't mention. And I guarantee you, if people are just listening, it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's great for Justin. He figured it out. You know, he had money, but really didn't have anything to do with the money. Yes. You live below your means, but you know, like you're saying, if your wife's making $36,000 a year, give or take, 
you know, that a, a teacher's salary, we all know education is not the highest paid uh, profession in the world as much as we'd like it to be, I think, for, for those of us who are parents. Um, the, the fact is, is you were probably blue collar, middle class, just like 90% of Americans out there, right? The rest of the world as well. And the big shift that happened for you had very little to do with the amount of money you were making, the amount of money you were saving, the amount of money that was like, I'm pretty sure your bank account didn't all of a sudden go from maybe, you know, 10,000 to 100,000 to a million overnight because the the banks just started paying you 100% interest, right? Correct. Like the, the main shift that happened was between your two ears, right? Yeah. You had a major revelation, which was, oh, my buddy's talking about doing this thing. Sounds crazy. I'll just watch. And most people wouldn't even get to that. They'd say it sounds crazy and trying to talk him out of that. You took the next logical step, which was, okay, I'll watch and I'll see. And if it's successful, I'll emulate it or I'll invest with them. But then the big shift was, holy shit, like this works. Why, why wouldn't I do this? Why shouldn't I do this? And I, I think that's just, that's missing in so many people's minds. Like we're, we're in this acquisition mode where we're going out and we're buying companies and we're acquiring assets for almost nothing, which is great. And turning that into cash flowing assets as well. I know Erock and I are talking about partnering on things and doing things together. It's just like there's so much opportunity out there that I can't understand why people don't adopt that mindset. You know, so just kudos to you. I just want to make sure I pointed that out. But I know Erock has questions. Well, my question was going to be: so you you know, there's this like publicity train that's happened probably over the last few decades of like, you know, acquire real estate, no money down, other people's money, OPM, right? So how I'm just curious, like so in terms of someone who's out there that's like, I'm trying to cross that bridge, right? Did you structure the deal just leveraging like a certain amount of your money to be able to put on deposit to to get the mortgages to finance the deal? Or and in, and in, in how creative did you get? And then did you also? Ha- but also, I think how and then how much mentorship did your friend give you to put the deal structure together to kind of help you cross that bridge? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think that's one of the the unique parts about it is because the the world's really your oyster when it comes to negotiating deals. Like th- there's the maybe standard that everyone else uh, or that most people think. And, and because there is a standard way that things are done, most people just fall into that by default. They don't they don't try to restructure. They don't ask for different terms. It's just kind of assume that it's this way. And uh, for me, I just, I think that every deal is different. Every deal is unique. I found a motivated seller that uh, was really a nice guy. We built a good rapport. I knew that that was one thing I could do well is build rapport. And uh, he agreed to seller finance this property to me, this mobile home park. And we agreed on 15% down. And then he carried the paper on the rest of it on a 10 year note at 5% with an option to extend another 10 years. So, I wow. mean, the terms are just unbelievable. And to be able to buy something for 15% down, I mean, that's just unheard of. And and it's a non-recourse loan. So if I messed up, he couldn't come after any of my assets. All I would do is give the property back to him and be done. So it was really as as low risk as you're going to get. I would lose my down payment. But during the time of my down payment, uh, I will have been making money. So let's say because it cash flowed day one. And I, I, for me personally, I don't buy properties that don't cash flow day one. Uh, I know some people do and they bank on appreciation. That to me is just not the strategy that, uh, that works for me. I want more security. I want to know that it's going to work out financially and I can, I can live my lifestyle using those funds immediately day one. Uh, and so I was able to, and so I, I calculated, you know, how much I was earning on this and, and how long it would take to recoup my, Um, down payment if I ended up just being horrible at this, which I didn't think was going to be the case. And it was so low risk. I was like, this is a no brainer. Let's do it. And of course I had nerves. It was the first, you know, major deal I've ever done. I mean, I was scared out of my mind. I remember like waking up in the middle of the night thinking, am I crazy? Like, what am I doing here? Why am I even thinking about this? I've got a safe job. You know, I do really well. Like I'm, I can provide for my family. Like I'm, I'm good. I don't need this. this. I am crazy, aren't I? 
And then, you know, other points of the time in the day, I'm like, man, this is a really smart thing. And so I went back and forth. And finally, I was like, ah, just, I'm just going to do it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And it ended up working out even better than we projected. So that particular deal ended up being uh, a 54% cash on cash return in year one. So yeah, go to that to the people that can barely make uh, 8% or 6% in the market these days or you know, you look back on it now and not to put words in your mouth, but I'd imagine you'd be kicking yourself in today's economy if you said, oh, I'm going to give into the fear and capitulate and say, I've got a, a, safe, a safe, steady job, right? Like, I, I hope that if there's anybody who's listening to this podcast right now who's thinking of maybe I should become an investor, maybe I should become an entrepreneur, but I don't know, it's kind of scary. Well, hopefully the, the kick in the ass has already come with this government shutdown and business is going out. Like I was reading stuff today about the healthcare system, the thing that we think is going to be our saving grace to this whole craziness that's happening in the world. Um, they're furloughing employees. Hospitals are shutting down. Hospitals are going bankrupt. All right. Like to me, that's just a sign of the times. Like this, this is just all crazy and smoke and mirrors in my opinion. But um, regardless of that fact, it, there's no job that's secure or safe for forever. Right. Um, so I know you'd be kicking yourself right now if you didn't make that leap and, you know, again, kudos to you. So I want to shift the conversation a little bit just because we're, we're running low on time here, but the 10 commandments of lifestyle investing, what are they? Why'd you come up with them? How can people apply them? Yeah, sure. So I, I've been trying to, uh, kind of capture what it is that I do and is small of a, you know, bite-sized one page piece of paper as I can, right? So I'm, I'm trying to gather what is it that I do, but how do I simplify this so that people can understand it? And, and what I can do beyond there is I can, you know, expand on these. And that's currently what I'm doing in, in the book that's going to come out in a couple of months, which is called The Lifestyle Investor, The 10 Commandments of cash flow Investing for Passive Income and Financial Freedom. And that's where I'm going to go in a lot more Great detail. Title. By the way, just had to interrupt you. Great title. That's Thank awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And um, and so I give a bunch of case studies, but you know, I'm happy to walk you through them. The first commandment's real simple. It's got to be lifestyle first. It's got to support my lifestyle. It needs to be something that's not going to require a lot of time from me. Um, in in my mind, I, I'm okay trading time for money if the time is being paid at a very high rate. Otherwise, I have no desire to do it. You know, for a while, I just stopped trading time because I didn't need my time to produce income. But now I've had some really unique opportunities come along and, and with consulting or advising or um, some different, you know, different opportunities there corporately or, or you know, with, with some executives. And uh, it makes sense for me to spend some of my time that way. But from a pure investment standpoint, I don't want it to cramp my style. I don't want it to slow down what it is that I want to do. I want my lifestyle to kind of be first and foremost and be able to spend all the time that I want to and should be able to with my family. Um, the second one is reducing the risk. So most people don't realize that they can reduce their risk, that a deal, the way that it shows up is not the way the deal has to end up, that there's some negotiating power there. Additionally, there's leverage, leverage from a capital standpoint and leverage even from a scale and, and automation standpoint. So those are things to consider. The third commandment is finding invisible deals. And this is one where I like to look into, you know, let's call them uh, frontier investments or frontier opportunities where it's the new emerging markets. Uh, there's so many huge opportunities in, you know, whether it be uh, real estate or di different asset classes inside of real estate or cannabis or uh, CBD or, you know, just a number of things. Even some of these uh, retail brands that are going out of business, there's tons of opportunity in, the, in those and scaling them online. So that, you know, and when I say invisible deal, I think most people just look at kind of what's out there versus taking a look at what could be out there, seeing things that don't exist, but could exist. And, and I think that's important. Um, the fourth commandment is getting your principal back quickly. So for me, that's really important because I want to be able to reinvest that money. 
So if I make an investment and I can get my capital back, that, that principal investment back in one or two or three years and reinvest it in something else, you know, I'm really going to compound my money a lot faster than if it has to sit in an investment for five, seven, 10, 15 years. So that one has been hugely beneficial because I found a lot of investments that have returned my principal within a year or within a year and a half. And so I've really gotten that money to work for me. The fifth commandment is creating cash flow immediately. And uh, I talked about this earlier, but I want to be able to use that money today. If I close on something, I want to have an opportunity, you know, within a month, at the longest within a quarter to have some sort of distribution of cash flow that I can spend. And for me at this point in my life, I don't spend any of it uh, on lifestyle. I'm covered there. So it is 100% going to a new investment. So every bit of cash flow I get creates more uh, assets that produce cash flow. And I'm just compounding that every payment on every deal. The sixth commandment is finding an income amplifier. And when I talk about that, I mentioned this a little bit more earlier, but it's, it's negotiating preferred terms. It's It's having an idea of a way that makes the deal better. You, you can de-risk it. Or you can just amplify the, the rewards. You know, maybe it has something to do with an equity kicker uh, as part of the deal. Or maybe there are some improved terms if you can invest as a co-investment on something. Um, or you can get, you know, experts in involved in some way. Uh, or finding a way to take a portion of the revenue at some point in the equation. You know, these would be all examples of finding an income amplifier, maybe even warrants. You know, there's a lot of ways to do it. Seller finance would be another way, you know, it's an income amplifier. I would have done my first mobile home park deal, even if I had to use a lender, but it was amplified because I could put less down and I didn't have to go through the process of getting a bank and that bank note would have been a recourse loan. So in, in every way that you skin it, the seller finance deal was like three times better. Uh, commandment number seven is cutting out the fat. And so in this one, what I like is to be able to cut out middlemen when it makes sense. I'm happy to pay middlemen when it is a necessary thing, but I like cutting the banks out as much as I can. I don't feel the banks often offer much value. Sometimes they do, and then I'll use them. And when they don't, I won't use them. Uh, I like cutting out brokers whenever it makes sense, unless they're offering value. If they offer value because they brought me something I otherwise wouldn't have had, I'm happy to pay them. But if I don't need them, I don't want to pay them. Uh, cutting out fund managers, you know, uh, that's another one. And, and by the way, not all fund managers are, are the same. You know, some really bring value and, and make their clients money and others don't. And so I think that's an important evaluation, especially today, where most Americans are just investing in the stock market through a 401k or, you know, through their advisor, but their advisor makes money even if they don't. I don't like that relationship. And I think it's important to analyze, you know, when you could just invest in index funds and pay the lowest fee that exists, why, you know, pay more when you may not be getting the return of that. And by the way, there are plenty of financial managers out there that do a good job and do get the return. I just think that that should be an analysis. That shouldn't just be like, hey, I'm just going to pay this person and hope that it works out. Um, no, commandment number eight is to plus the deal. And so this would be an example of when everything seems to be um, negotiated in a way that makes sense, that you like the terms. Is there anything else that can happen that can get you a little extra results, you know, a little more, you know, maybe you're negotiating an extra piece of rev share equity, like I mentioned before, like, where does that make sense? How can you, maybe it's an accelerated um, distribution schedule. Uh, maybe it's uh, an accelerated depreciation schedule, you know, so just little extra things that can create more of a plus uh, to make the upside more and the downside uh, more capped. Commandment number nine is use leverage to your advantage. So earlier I said cut out the, the, the fat, cut out the middlemen whenever possible. But I think you should use leverage whenever it serves you. And 
for me, it has served me really well because I can buy properties putting just 15, 20, 25% down and I can use someone else's money and I can grow that asset. The asset appreciates and I'm making cash flow today when the vast majority is financed by someone else. So not only am I getting cash flow today, the better of a job I do at increasing that cash flow then is going to directly impact and grow the value of the asset. So what a great way to use someone else's money to grow my net worth. Uh, and another example with that would be whole life. I'm a huge fan of whole life with cash values because that's another leverage point where I can use my cash value as the down payment, which is basically a loan against my own cash values. My cash values are still going to get a return, right? I'm still going to get my, my annual dividend. But now I just took the same money and I invested that in another deal and I'm earning a second return on the same money. So one of the reasons that banks are able to create a lot of uh, capital and a lot of wealth is because of fractional reserve lending. They can take the money you give them and lend that same amount of money out 10 times. Uh, well, now even more because of some of the new uh, Fed, Fed rules, uh, the Fed legislation, um, where they don't have to keep any of your capital on hand. But uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is I now have, you know, one degree or two degrees of fractional reserve lending at my disposal because that's the way I'm using my, my cash value whole life policy. And that has been able to grow my wealth significantly. And then the last commandment, commandment 10, is that every dollar of investment gets a return. And what I mean by that is I am a student, first and foremost and always. And so I want people to teach me. When I, when I invest, I'm going to learn what happens on that money because obviously I'm, I have skin in the game, so I'm just that much more ready to learn. But every professional that I engage, one of the things, one of my rules is I don't let professionals just do my work for me. I interview them and I say, hey, if we're going to work together, my expectation is that you're going to teach me why you're doing what you're doing. So I'm okay with you completing the task, like that's what I'm paying you for, but I'm also paying you to educate me along the way so I understand what you're doing. And that has had just compound interest for me. I've been able to get a lot done without needing financial or, or let's call it professional services. Uh, I'm more than happy to pay for it. And I'm more than happy to pay good money for the best that are out there because I want the best teaching me. Um, but really, that has been one of my best investments is just choosing to learn from my CPA, from different uh, advisors, business advisors, and and. Uh, financial advisors, uh, legal advisors. I mean, th this has been one of the greatest returns of anything that I've done. Yeah, no doubt about it, right? The, I mean, that that's an incredible list. And thank you so much for sharing that, Justin. And, and what was the name of the book again that's coming out? Yeah, The Lifestyle Investor, The Ten Commandments of Cashflow Investing for Passive Income and Financial Freedom. Perfect. I love it. I know the people are going to be picking that up. And what's the, what's the release date on that? Do you know yet? Yeah, it's going to be about two months. So give, okay. give or take. So somewhere around the middle of the year, 2020. So good deal in case anybody's uh, listening to this down the road. Normally at this point, I would ask, you know, what was your, your favorite mistake or failure that you, you ran into? But I think you've given us so many nuggets already that I don't know that we need to go into that. But uh, e do you have any last questions here? Um, I would just say as, as just a way to kind of finish off the interview today would be, you know, sitting in the ecosystem that we're in and then knowing that you are connecting with fellow investors and in various groups, you know, if you were looking to kind of start from scratch, right? Because to try to appeal to somebody out there who's trying to cross that bridge from, you know, employee or self-employed into investor, what market or what opportunities do you think are available in the current ecosystem? Well, I'll say that there are a lot of different ways to do it. There's no right way. And, you know, just, just from trial and error, I have learned so many things that I didn't know when I first started. I've learned that there are so many different ways to actually make money. And it's just fascinating. I think real estate in general is probably one of the safest ways to start. And the reason I say that is because with the stock market, that 
that's something that like if you have an investment, if you buy stock in a company, that can literally go to zero. If something happens, if that company goes out of business, you can lose all your money. In real estate, there's going to be an intrinsic built-in value of an asset. And you know that at least at a minimum, it's going to be worth a certain amount. It's not going to go to zero. And I think that that really de-risks it. And as long as you can figure out how to make it cash flow, um, I just think that's one of the best ways to get started. And you have massive depreciation that you can take. So typically, you don't pay a whole lot of taxes, if any taxes, on the gains. So I actually want to take a different approach on this one, Justin, because you you gave an answer that I think is uh, you know, spot on for people and they don't probably realize it, which is do what you just mentioned in commandment number 10, which is you have to invest in your education first and foremost, right? Because there are so many opportunities out there. And I mean, just by going and talking to a really good CPA or an enrolled agent or somebody that understands that, they'll probably be able to save you money on taxes or even get you money back, right? So you spend a few thousand dollars for a, 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 C, a good CPA, they can probably get you money back from the last few years. Or go learn about whole life insurance and go look up the term infinite banking concept. Uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name that coined that phrase, but it's essentially doing what you're talking. Nelson Nash. There you go. There you go. Um, Mr. Nash. And yeah, I mean, you invested a lot of money in your education over your, over the years. And I know that I have to, I know that E-Rock has to anybody who's, um, you know, lifted themselves up by their bootstraps and kind of found, made a name for themselves or done anything of worth in their lives. The first investment has always been in themselves and their education. So I would say that you, I agree with you that real estate absolutely always has intrinsic value. There's always some underlying asset as long as you don't really screw up the the contracts and negotiations there. But um, the first thing you got to do is you got to educate yourself and, and then find the right advisors to put around you. I'd say that would be my first recommendation based off of your commandments. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and just even a, a follow on to that is I remember at one point in time, I used to get so annoyed paying legal fees. Like it, it, it used to bother me so much. I'm like, it's so expensive. But when you find the right legal advice and you find advisors, you know, like my attorney, well, I have seven, but, but my main attorney that I use for most things, he is just so great at what he does. It may, I'm, I'm happy to pay him because not only is he making me more money with his expertise, but then I'm learning all the stuff along the way. So I get an education as the byproduct of learning, uh, of earning more because of, you know, engaging him into that, you know, specific business situation. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. I mean, it, it, that's incredible. I just love it. Um, awesome, Justin. Well, I got to be mindful of the time here. I know we've gone a little bit long here, but I, I know that everybody's listening to this is probably appreciated. And I need to make sure that they know where they can find you, find out more about you. How can they connect with you? Yeah, sure. I have a website, justindonald.com. You can also go to lifestyleinvestor.com. Uh, that will redirect to, to my website. So anyone that is uh, interested in learning more, uh, I even have a tab uh, at the bottom of justindonald.com where they can click on that and ask questions, inquire about any of the different pro programs or products that, that we offer. Perfect. Absolutely love it. Justin, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I know our listeners do as well. Iraq, any last comments or, or words? I just love that, that you came from a place of where you really were conscientiously intentional about working hard to raise your own capital that got you the start that you needed. And then I think a learning lesson that a lot of people are going to benefit from is, is to some extent, living within your means is a way of investing in yourself to be able to to, to capitalize into that financial freedom you're talking about in your book. So just want to say that that's a great takeaway that I hope that people are going to benefit from, from the long term. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me on the podcast today. And uh, it was really fun chatting. Absolutely. Justin, thank you so much. Again, my name is Jeff Barnes with Angel Investors Network. e Christopher, Biz Famous. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you. You've been listening to Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions with your host, Jeff Barnes, brought to you by the Angel Investors Network. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on Apple iTunes or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. 
Go to www.angelnetwork.com for tools, resources, show notes, and more, as well as our free training on how to become a successful angel investor and entrepreneur.